Welcome viewers, Dr. Jason W. Morrison, Theologist, New South Wales, Australia. We are doing Watchtower Study Edition, November 9, 2019. It's New Year's Eve. Um, we're up to the heart, to heart communication. A very strange, very strange article this. And I'll show you the reasons why. Paragraph 8. We might find it difficult to open up to others because someone might have hurt us in the past. And that's a very, very good reason not to open up to others. If someone's hurt, hurt you in the past, then that's a very, very good reason to be very careful about who you're going to share your important parts of yourself with. You've got to protect your privacy. Now, this is trying to undermine, to a certain extent, your ability to be very careful about who you speak to. And what this is actually doing is it's provoking backbiting and gossip and all this other stuff, because if people know too much, this is where all the slander and other things come from. Or we may feel that we lack the time and energy to cultivate close relationships. Well, the fact of the matter is that could be the truth. You can't be everything to everyone. However, we should not give up. Give up what? Just have a normal, structured life. If we want our brothers to stand by us when trials come. Now, this is conditional. This is a conditional statement. If we want our brothers to stand by us when trials come, we must learn to trust them now with our thoughts and feelings. I don't agree with that statement. I'm sorry. No. Um, trusting people with your thoughts and feelings is a very exclusive privilege for someone to have. You've got to be very careful, as it said here, who you share your thoughts and feelings with because you'll be betrayed, you'll be undermined. It gives people, as a matter of fact, if you're not careful, it empowers people to undermine you. And that is an important step toward becoming true friends. No, it's not necessarily. If you're on a soccer team with someone, you don't get there spewing out all your thoughts and feelings about everything. The proverb says a couple of times that even a fool's counted wise if he holds his tongue. What's this say? Now, that you have purified yourselves by your obedience to the truth, that's the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, knowing that all your issues between yourself and God have been resolved for time and eternity, never to be worried about again, with unhypoc unhypocritical brotherly affection. Yeah, you've got to be careful what this sort of affection is suggesting and how it's interpreted. Um, Unhypocritical brotherly respect might be a better word. As a result, love one another intensely from the heart. Um, you've got to get it, this in a try perspective. There's four types of love. There's love toward God. There's your family love. There's friends love. And then there's another love. I forget what it is. Storge, Philios, Agape, and there was another one. I can't think of it off a hand, but you've got love for God, love for people, family love, and then I think it's parental love or one of, one of those. But you've got to keep it in its right perspective. You can't just spew your thoughts and feelings out to everyone because you're going to exhaust yourself and come undone. Jesus showed that he trusted his friends by communicating openly with them. No, Jesus, remember, he would choose James, Peter and John to privately come with him at certain instances, didn't he? And might I just say, I no longer call you slaves, Jehovah Witnesses, Jesus said, because the slave does not know what his master does. But I have called you friends. Did you know you're the friend of, of God through the Lord Jesus Christ? because I have made known to you all the things that I have heard from my Father, who is Jehovah. Did you know you're God's friend? You don't owe him anything. You're his friend. If we, if we, can, intimate, we can imitate him by sharing our joys, concerns and disappointments with others, 
Listen carefully as someone talks to you and you may learn that you have many thoughts, feelings and goals in common. Consider the example of Cindy, a sister in her 20s. She befriended a pioneer in her 60s named Mary Louise. Cindy and Mary Louise work together in field service every Thursday morning and they talk freely with each other about a variety of subjects. I'm sure they do, and a lot of it would be whinging and backbiting prettied up. Cindy says, I enjoy having deep conversations with friends because this helps me to know and understand them better, and probably yourself. Friendships thrive in warm atmosphere of open communication. That's true, as long as it's constructive. Like Cindy, if you take the initiative to have warm and open conversations, with others, your friendships with them are likely to grow. And Proverbs 27.9 says, Oil and incense make the heart rejoice, so do sweet friendships springing from sincere counsel. And, and notice the sincere counsel. You can't just throw out and spew out your thoughts and feelings to everyone because um, you will at some stage get hurt. You will get hurt, as you did in the past. So there's a certain amount of wisdom connected to this. This is we'll watch some videos now. Hey guys, how's it going? It's me, Smurf Girl. So I want to talk about Jehovah's Witnesses and suicide. Like a serious, serious topic. Because it is a major problem in the organization and when you leave the organization. It's not just one or the other. It really is something um, where every Jehovah's Witness, like when they're in the organization, they are extremely suicidal, all of them, very depressed. Um, and so when you leave the organization, that suicidal tendency that you don't even know you have because it's in your subconscious, you don't even know it. When you leave, that suicidal tendency that's groomed in you can be turned on very, very easily. And so I want to talk about that because that's why the suicide rate of ex-Jehovah's Witnesses is so high because there's... There's a suicide switch that is mind controlled and brainwashed into you and you don't even know you have it. You literally don't. And every single one of us has it. And that's why most Jehovah's Witnesses are on some form of antidepressant or just unchecked depression. Because when you sign that no blood transfusion policy card, the no blood transfusions, you basically are agreeing to let yourself die. And that is always in the back of your mind that you're going to consciously commit assisted suicide, that you're going to agree to let yourself die. And so that's always in the back of your mind. Every single time you get your wallet, your driver's license, you get your purse as a female, that's in there. Every single time you have a car accident or almost have a car accident, that's in your mind. Oh my goodness, I almost got in a wreck. What if I would have needed a blood transfusion? I would have had to agree to die. And that's always in, in your mind. And I remember with my mother, she would all the time say to me, I hope I get in a car wreck. I just hope I go and I get in a car wreck and then I can just refuse a blood transfusion and just go to sleep. I could just, oh, the world is so awful. I could just really use a break. Just go to sleep and wake up in paradise. It'll be over. It's like a, it's like a one-way ticket to paradise because Jehovah's Witnesses know this because they say it all the time. When you say, I say to them all the time at the cart sometimes, my mother died because of the blood trans, no blood transfusion policy, and so did my grandmother. And they'll say every time, well, at least they died faithful. And they know if you die faithful, that is a guaranteed ticket into paradise, or at least they think it is. And so that's the preferred way that a Jehovah's Witness would actually want to die. Think about it. 
get in some tragic accident. And if you know that everybody says it, at least, at least, you know, they died faithful. Holy cow. Where sometimes it's like you can tempt fate. It's like, no, I want to die due to the no blood transfusion. Sign me up. I can't wait to get in a tragic accident and let myself die faithful. Wouldn't that be awesome? Where it's a suicidal tendency. Instantly, suicidal tendency. And my mom would say it all the time. I just need a break. Like this world is so awful. I can't take it anymore. If I could just get in some tragic accident, I would gladly let myself bleed out. And she did. She couldn't wait. The sweet release. Just take a nap for a little while and you wake up in paradise. I was like, it's like you're waiting. You can't wait to die early. You can't. It's suicidal tendency. What are you thinking? How dare you say that to me? What, you're going to leave me an orphan? Like, that's what I would say to my mom. You're going to what? You want to leave me an orphan? How dare you? And that's what I feel like. Like, I'm an orphan now, even though I'm an adult. I still feel like she left me an orphan. Because she died before she needed to. She didn't have to die that way. And neither did grandma. And it's, it's a conscious decision that you make. Where well, here's this life-saving treatment. It's just treatment, like chemo or anything else. Something they put in you that restores your life. But no, it's taboo. You can't do it. And so you get groomed with that sort of thinking. And a lot of ex-Jehovah's Witnesses, they get so depressed, so sad, pushed over the edge. I've had, I can't even count how many people I know have, have died from suicide. Two cousins, one on each side of the family. One shot himself in the face and the other one hung himself. And I know that they're thinking in their head when it's being done. Because then there was another guy, he got married and the day after his wedding, he went out into the, everybody suspected he was gay. And that he married, the, the man that he was in love with, he married his sister. Just to be close to him. And the day after his wedding, he went out in the woods and he shot himself because he just couldn't handle it. And I know the what they're thinking is that Jehovah will understand. I'm so depressed and so distraught. How could he not resurrect me because I'm just so depressed? He'll understand. And if he doesn't, oh, well, you know, and they do it because I've been there. I have been there. The first boy I was ever in love with. Oh my goodness. Um, he committed suicide in 2012. And that was devastating. Absolutely devastating. So you've got to be kidding me. That was just heartbreaking. And he snuck into, he was being shunned and he snuck into his Jehovah's Witness parents' house. And he died inside their house. I'm not exactly sure how he did it. But it was terrible. And they didn't put it in his obituary. They did not put a current picture of him. He was 39 years old. They put a picture of him when he was about 16 or 17. Because that was how they wanted to remember him. Not when he was not being raised a Jehovah's Witness. That was the vision they had of him. And so when I saw his obituary and it was like, that's the boy that, you know, so in love with as a teenage girl. That's how I remembered him too. And so I knew that's what his mom was thinking. If he just wouldn't have left the truth, you know, if he would have just gotten baptized at that age, that's how I remember him. I, I know that's what she was thinking. And it's heartbreaking. It's just terrible. 
And he was an only child, and, and me being an only child too, I know how desperate you get. Where it's like, I just want my parents. You're not allowed to grow up. You're held in this kind of constant state of not being an adult and you can't make your own decisions because your parents are still trying to force you to bend to their wishes and it's like no I don't want to be a Jehovah's Witness let me grow up and be my own person no matter what that is and please continue to love me even if it's a bad decision just let me do it and don't remove your love in, in the meantime like for goodness sake this is terrible and so a lot of us adult, raised in the truth, Jehovah's Witness kids, we're not allowed to grow up. We can't mature the right way. And it's just bad decision after bad decision. And when you do that and you don't have your parents to help you rebound, you just get in this suicidal state. Where it's like, fine, nobody loves me anyway. Nobody even cares. Nobody will even realize I'm gone. I know that's why he snuck into his parents' house because otherwise they would never even known he was dead. And I, because I know him very, very well. I, I just, you know, when you just know somebody, I know that's exactly what he was thinking because we would talk about it all the time. My parents wouldn't even know I was dead. One time he even, when we were in our 20s, he staged his own um, kidnapping where he had his friends pretend to kidnap him, like drug lords had kidnapped him. And I I knew what was going on. Like, oh my goodness. Like, I know the, the people that he's hanging with. And I, I know it's who's probably doing it. And it's, I'm talking to his parents and he was huge into drugs. And his dad says, his Jehovah's Witness stepdad, he's like, you think he's on drugs, possibly? I'm like, are you kidding me? You don't even know if he's on drugs? Like, I I had no, I'd seen him do meth in front of me. I was like, of course he's on drugs. And he didn't believe me. He literally didn't believe me. I'm like, he carries, you know, that backpack he carries with him everywhere he goes? He's like, yeah. I'm like, that's what's in there. A scale? An eight ball? And that's how he, you know, supports his habit and himself. I didn't realize that. Like, just this gullible Jehovah's Witness parent. I'm like, you are a moron. I can't believe it. But he still didn't believe me. And he just wanted attention. He wanted to see if his parents would care. I'm like, you need to make sure he's okay. He could be killed. You don't understand who he's hanging out with. And they just weren't even scared. It's like, well, that's the decision he made. He's not going to meetings. And it's like he's apparently kidnapped. He can't go to meetings. Like, you're shunning him and he needs you. You don't understand. And I knew I was just I was like talking to my own parents. It's like, I can't talk sense into them. So fine. And when that happens, when, when you do do things like that, you realize my parents are not going to be there for me. And you get very, very depressed after being groomed to have that, you know, suicidal thoughts in, in, in your head anyway. From you prepare yourself at any moment, you could have to refuse a blood transfusion, which means you have to choose death. It's like life, death, life, death, life, death, life, death. Nope. You can't. You have to choose death every single time in that situation. And so you get used to having the thought, I need to choose death. I need to choose death. I need to choose death. I got that blood card in my wallet. Choose death. Choose death. Choose death. And so when you get so depressed, what's the first thing you're going to choose? You're going to choose death because that's been ingrained in you since birth. That your parents are going to choose death for you that you should choose death for you you choose to and you hear that in your head no matter what the scenario is and it's devastating it's absolutely devastating and no one cares enough anywhere in the world no government cares to even do a poll to find out about the statistics it's impossible because there's so many people leaving and joining and it's how would you even be able to figure that out? Like, was he an ex-Jehovah's Witness? That suicide victim, you know? 
Was he ever involved with the Jehovah's Witnesses at any point in his life? Like somebody needs to figure this out because it's a major controversy. It's a major detriment and people need to know. Even if they aren't a current Jehovah's Witness, were they raised a Jehovah's Witness? And to figure this out because it's just an epidemic. It can't continue. I mean, when I saw that boy, he wasn't a boy. He was 39 years old, but I see him as a boy in my head. When when I saw that, that he was dead, I was like, just not one more. Like, please, just not. Like, that was just, like, I can't take it anymore. And they don't even bury them properly. It's like, well, they died a disgrace. They committed suicide. It's like, well, you made them commit suicide. And then you don't even give them a proper burial. They don't even remember them properly. Every single time. I wonder how many people, how many families, witness families, don't even know their loved ones are dead. They don't even know they're missing. Like, that's even a whole other thing. These people that drop off the face of the earth, like at the Kingdom Hall, and you never see them again. It's like, oh, I guess they stopped going to meetings. I don't know. They fell out of the truth, and nobody looks out for them. Nobody goes and checks it out. Are they alive? No, I guess they just don't want to be a witness anymore. I don't know. Start shunning them. And they could be trapped in a well or something. Like they could be they could be kidnapped or, you know, something awful and